Okay, uh, so today I am going to discuss this uh, topic that I had briefly started namely um, I just want to find a bridge between the topics we have been dis uh, discussing till now namely uh, classical field theory and the topics that are going to come subsequently which is quantum field theory. So, this uh, particular lecture is going to be an abridge between these two subjects and I am trying to lead you gently into quantum field theory by giving you examples uh, that you are familiar with or you know at least uh, in, in certain contexts you are familiar with them, but I am going to uh, utilize them in a new context which uh, uh, there will be some new ingredients. Okay, uh, so, in order to achieve this uh, I am going to introduce this familiar uh, Schrodinger equation which is the time dependent Schrodinger equation and uh, we all know that uh, uh, this is what it is uh, in one dimension and um, so there is nothing surprising uh, or new about this idea. Uh, the only thing uh, the new ingredient is going to come when I uh, make a reinterpretation of this potential energy function. So, I am going to say that this potential energy function uh, has two parts to it. One is the time independent part and the time dependent part is going to be a uh, localized impulse. That means that you know what an impulse is basically it is a, it's a disturbance that exists for an infinitesimal duration. That means, it is an extremely strong disturbance that exists for a very short while. So, that is what an impulse is. So, you see that is the reason why there is a Dirac delta function and an associated amplitude. But not only uh, do we have to understand or uh, explain what the uh, potential is as a function of time. So, we have uh, decided to uh, say that it is basically a time independent part plus the time dependent part which is an in impulse. But then we also have to explain what how that impulse changes from point to point in space. So, I am going to assert that uh, the impulse is also impulsive in the uh, spatial part also. That means, it is a localized impulse. That means, that uh, that impulse only exists at a position called x0 and then it exists for a very short while at time t0. So, given these two uh, conditions, so you can imagine, so it is like you know just uh, taking a you know a dagger and stabbing that line at some point momentarily you know. So, these electrons are minding their own business or these uh, particles, these quantum particles are minding their own business and then you just take a dagger and stab that at x0 at time t0 and then you release. So, then you see what happens to that system. So, obviously, it is going to get disturbed. So, uh, the Green's function of the system is basically the difference between the solution of the Schrodinger equation before it was disturbed and after it was disturbed. So, that is what the Green's function of the system is because it is called Green's function because you see that disturbance is an impulse both spatially and temporally. So, now we are going to assert that uh, we know how the wave function looks like uh, when before the impulse. So, we are going to assert that it was in some stationary state determined by uh, the solution of the time independent Schrodinger equation. So, uh, that is given by these uh, this stationary uh, state Eigen functions. So, now after impulse uh, it is clear that it is uh, because these stationary state eigenfunctions forms a basis I can uh, use that basis to uh, represent the wave function after the impulse as a linear combination of that basis. So, which is precisely what I have done here. Okay, I have used the uh, psi as basis phi, phi nu as the basis and I have expressed uh, the wave function after the impulse in terms of the wave function uh, before the impulse. So, the wave function before the impulse was stationary states. Okay, so, now how do I go about determining these coefficients which will be necessary in order for me to express this or basically write down the solution after the impulse explicitly. So, the answer to that is the following that you first of all uh, realize that uh, this potential function uh, has a part which is an impulse which is a Dirac delta function. So, if you integrate uh, 
with respect to time. So, if you integrate both sides of this equation with respect to time from t equal to just before t 0 and just after t 0. So, you integrate from t 0 minus epsilon to t 0 plus epsilon. Then you see that clearly uh, the terms which do not involve the delta functions drop out. So, that is the reason why these, these things do not contribute, but the, the one so even this does not contribute. So, what contributes is the fact that uh, the integral of the derivative of with respect to time is clearly the wave function. So, what is that going to say is that basically the wave function is discontinuous and the strength of that uh, the jump the value of the discontinuity is determined by the, the strength of the delta function there. So, it multiplies by the wave function, but then the wave function is evaluated at the time at which the impulse takes place. Okay. So, it is actually x 0 t 0. Okay. So, uh, so, this is what that is. So, now you can go ahead and uh, you can use your ansatz, namely this ansatz, you can use it here. Okay. So, if you use it there, so, what this says is basically that uh, uh, before, before the impulse it was just this and after the impulse it became this right. So, this is before, uh, this is after. So, before uh, the wave function was this, after it is now this because it is uh, after it is a combination of stationary states, it is not stationary anymore after the impulse. So, this difference therefore, is the uh, jump or the strength of the, the basically is the measure of discontinuity how, how much how discontinuous the wave function is and that is given by the coefficient of the impulse basically it is given by this expression. So, you might be wondering that uh, that seems to be at odds with what you might have learnt in your quantum mechanics courses that wave function always has to be continuous but I am seeming to imply here that the wave function is discontinuous and the discontinuity is determined by this. Uh, so, I think what the instructors of your traditional courses uh, forgot to tell you or they did not have in mind is potentials which are very, very singular like this. So, they implicitly assume that uh, real life does not produce potentials that are extremely singular like this. That means, stabbing kind of potential that, that is it is impulsive both spatially and also temporally. So, uh, those are uh, unusual type of uh, potentials and uh, certainly if you include them in your discussion, wave function is not continuous. Okay. It is continuous whenever you say that uh, other than that any other potential is allowed. So, if any other potential is allowed, then wave function and usually its first derivative is also continuous. Okay. But in this uh, somewhat uh, pathological example, uh, the wave function itself is discontinuous okay. and the discontinuity is determined by the strength of the Dirac delta function or basically the strength of the impulse. So, now uh, how do I determine these coefficients? So, clearly I use the orthogonality properties of the basis and then I go ahead and uh, multiply by the uh, complex conjugate and then in, I integrate. So, if I, when I do that I get this result. Okay. So, this is going to be my, so uh, keep in mind that uh, nu is the starting you know the, the system was in that particular stationary state called nu before the impulse was turned on. So, that that always exists in your final answer because it is a new prime that is getting summed over. Okay. So, the new already always exists, it was there earlier, it is still there now. So, new is what we started off with, the system was in a stationary state labeled by nu. Okay, so, now you go ahead and substitute uh, the answer we got for these coefficients and uh, so, you suppose now you specialize to the case of a free particle. So, that means, you know that V 0 x. So, I told you that uh, well, I am talking about stationary. So, before the impulse the system was in a stationary state determined by the solution of the time independent Schrodinger equation where the potential function was V 0 x. But then you can make a further simplification and ask yourself what do these solutions explicitly look like when this uh, when the system does not 
uh, have a in other words no force is acting on the particle. If no force is acting on the particle then clearly the energies are just energy of a free particle which is p squared by 2 m and keep in mind that p is h bar k. So, it is h bar k h bar squared k squared by 2 m and the wave functions are plane waves and that is what you get ok. So, the bottom line is the following. So, this is the answer basically. So, this is how it works and then uh, you have to convert the summation to an integration. So, keep in mind that uh, you know the way we usually deal with free particle is not really to because if you if it is genuinely free then it would violate some basic postulates of quantum mechanics namely the, the genuinely free particle has a plane wave uh, eigenstates and plane waves are not uh, normalizable. The mod square of the wave function cannot be uh, if you integrate it over all space you get infinity instead of 1 which is what you are supposed to get. Okay, so, uh, so you there is no way you can normalize a wave function like that. So, typically what people do is that we um, assume that there is a finite extent to the uh, spatial locations of the particle. So, we, uh, we first confine the particle to a box namely starting from a x equal to 0 all the way up to x equal to L. We say that the particle is confined to this box. Then we ask ourselves uh, what what would be the properties of the system. So, then once you confine it to the box then clearly the wave function is normalizable. Then we ask ourselves what would the wave functions look like and not only the wave functions but the observable properties look like as you make the box larger and larger. And uh, so, in the thermodynamic limit you get back your original what you wanted namely that uh, you did not want the box or you did not want the boundaries of the box to be present. So, you could uh, achieve that by first placing the system in a box then calculate your uh, uh, usual uh, uh, useful physical quantities and then you make the size of the box very large. And certainly you know ratios of uh, quantities that are proportional to the size of the box are going to be finite as you make the box larger and larger. So, which is what we are typically interested in. We are not interested in the the whole quantity itself is the quantity per unit length. So, so that sort of thing. So, those are typically finite. So, now the question is that you know if you confine uh, a particle to a box. Uh, so, the summation over k has a very specific meaning that see once you confine a particle to a box that k going is going to become discrete n pi by l. So, if you recall n was equal to 1 to uh, you know 0 was excluded because uh, the wave function was sin n pi x by l and you would uh, make the wave function become 0. So, if the wave function is 0 then its uh, integral of its mod square will never be 1 it will still be 0. So, it would not uh, be normalizable even then. So, 0 is excluded for that reason and negatives are excluded because you see the negative values of n are differ from the positive the wave functions are the same apart from a sign. And you know that uh, wave functions that differ by a sign or even a phase that is a complex number of unit modulus they refer to as they correspond to the same state. So, therefore, we only consider positive integers for uh, n and k is uh, written as n pi pi l. Okay, so, now how do I convert summation to an integration. So, so the, the way I do that is that uh, uh, first of all I am going to say that look uh, if I look at the values of k okay. So, if I look at uh, so, this is k n. So, if I look at k n plus 1 minus k n. So, these two are going to be incredibly close to each other. Okay. So, in other words uh, the, uh, the difference between the k's Okay, are going to be very small. So, rather than summing over n I could uh, equally well integrate over k, but then in order to do that what I am going to do is that I am going to say that look summation over n is same as integrating over n because n is dimensionless now and summing over n uh, without loss of generality when l is very large 
I can replace this by an integration over. So, this was so basically by definition this, okay. But then I am going to say that the, this is approximately when L is very large, this is approximately integral dn f k n, but then n goes from 1 to infinity. But now uh, you see uh, the point is that uh, if f of k n is even and uh, so, so one more point that uh, you see the, the bottom line is that when you sum over all the n's, the result that you get are typically of the size of the system, they are of the order of the size of the system capital L which goes to infinity. So now, uh, so even though n equal to 0 is excluded, so there is no loss of generality in just including it. So, I am going to just uh, write that uh, knowing fully well that the mistake I am making is negligible as the size of the system becomes larger and larger. So, now if f, f is even, so this can clearly be written as one half of integral dn from minus to plus, okay, dn. So, now keep in mind what n is, n is uh, L by pi into k and d, dn is therefore L by pi into dk. So, this can be written as L over 2 pi into integral dk uh, f of k. So, this is this is the reason why you uh, you know hear of people say that uh, in, uh, in the case of systems in the thermodynamic limit rather than uh, summing over discrete states, you integrate over the wave number and the way to convert the summation to an integration is through this prescription. Namely, you write sigma k, uh, it maps to an integral over k. Okay, so, that is a hand waving justification for converting a summation to an integration. So, that is what I have written here. So, when you do that, so you get this result. So, this is what you get. Okay, so, you convert this, there was a summation earlier and that got converted to an integration. So, when you evaluate that, you get this result. Okay, so, there is this particle, I mean this is this, uh, so the wave function after the impulse would have been uh, the same as it was before the impulse, namely this, this is the wave function before the impulse. So, after the impulse, it would have still remained this had it not been for the fact that now we have an impulse with strength uh, chi. Now, because of the impulse, the wave function suffers a modification, namely it becomes this. Okay. So, now this, this particular quantity is called uh, the Green's function of the system. Okay. So, it is called that because the wave function uh, with respect to, so this particular uh, solution was a, for an impulsive, you know, Dirac delta in space and time. But if you wanted to study the same problem for another different, completely different uh, v x comma t, you could first evaluate the Green's function which we have done now and then multiply by uh, the appropriate v of uh, x naught t naught and integrate over your x naught t naught to uh, basically get uh, whatever you want. So, so, basically the solution of the Green's function enables you to write down the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation uh, in a general way. So, that means you will find the most general solution to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so, that is the utility of Green's function. So, now I am going to uh, ask myself, look I am going to now shift my uh, interpretation to something interesting. So, this is uh, you know if there was one free particle in a box and it uh, suffered an impulsive disturbance and then its wave function changes according to this manner, that is what we have found. But now instead of one single solitary quantum particle in a box, imagine a whole bunch of them, specifically imagine a large number of them and imagine they are all fermions. So, if they are fermions, then clearly you cannot really populate more than 2 of them at a given uh, quantum number n. 
So the bottom line is that uh, we all know that for fermions the case get quickly filled up and it fills up to a maximum value determined by how many particles you have uh, in your system, the total number of them. So the point is the following that, uh, so imagine such a system, okay. So you have such a system and uh, now you focus on the electron which has the highest possible energy and that is called the Fermi energy. See if all the particles in your box were fermions, they would uh, necessarily occupy the only a few or two of them would occupy the lowest energy. The next uh, lowest energy would occupy, be occupied by another two and so on and so forth. Very rapidly you will uh, reach a very high energy because you have a huge number of electrons that you are attempting to fill into the system. So the point is that now, now that you have filled uh, your system up to that high uh, value of an energy, you ask yourself uh, what is the uh, wave function of that electron, okay. Suppose there, there was no uh, disturbance of any kind. So, so this is the system, this is the stationary state that you are in uh, to begin with. So now the question is what would be the wave function of an electron with that particular energy and keep in mind it is a free particle. So if it is a free particle then uh, it is uh, energy is called the Fermi energy which is denoted by E f and its wave number is called the Fermi wave number uh, and h bar k f is called the Fermi momentum which is p f, okay. So this is how the wave function of the particle with the highest possible energy look like. So assuming that uh, the box that you have in front of you contains a large number of uh, fermionic particles, okay. So and the, the one, the fermionic particle with the largest amount of energy is what we are interested in. And we have written down the wave function of that particular particle when there are no further disturbances. So when in other words when it is in a stationary state. So when it is in a stationary state this is what its wave function is. So now uh, we ask the question we have been asking earlier namely that how would this wave function change if there was a uh, impulsive disturbance. So the disturbance is impulsive as usual not only temporally but also spatially. So I am going to uh, as usual impose or disturb the system in a particular peculiar way and the way I do that is by uh, switching on an impulsive potential that is also highly localized in space. So when I do that I want to ask myself how does the wave function look like uh, subsequent to that impulse. Then I will allow you to work out the details but the answer comes out to be this. So it comes out to be this because see the point is that now we have made this physical assumption that uh, after the disturbance the, the particle which had the highest possible energy cannot all of a sudden occupy any lower energy because it only occupies states that are available to it namely now the, the ones that are not already occupied. So the energy states that are not already occupied are clearly greater than the Fermi energy because less than the Fermi energy there is this Fermi C that means you have all the uh, fermions have uh, kind of um, decided to occupy all the states below the Fermi energy in order to minimize the energy. Uh, overall energy of the system. So they have obeyed Pauli exclusion principle and occupied all states below the Fermi energy. So now once this impulse is applied clearly the electron with the highest or the fermion with the highest possible energy can do nothing uh, other than uh, excite itself uh, to a state with energy greater than the Fermi energy. So which is precisely what I have said here. So normally it would have been sum over all k, k dash. So it is k dash here. So it, it normally it would have been sum, sum over all k but now because uh, k values below 
the Fermi wave, wave number are not uh, available. So, in other words they are not available because uh, other fermions have already occupied those uh, states. So, therefore, the available ones are the only ones that this fermions can scatter into and uh, so that is what it does here. Okay. So, now uh, I am I'm going to tell you how to evaluate this. So, you see this description that I am giving you that the impulsive, uh, so I am implying by this description that somehow the impulsive uh, disturbance only excites the fermion with the highest possible energy. That is clearly not true because there is no reason why other electrons should not also find or should not also feel the impulse. But of course, here the implication is that that impulse also has a kind of bandwidth that means it is uh, it picks out electrons close to the highest possible energy and only uh, allows them to get excited. So, it is only then then all this interpretation makes sense. So, given that interpretation of the impulse namely that it has a bandwidth which enables it to preferentially uh, you know attack electrons with in the vicinity of the highest possible energy. So, uh, electrons with the highest possible energy have momentum either equal to h bar k f or minus h bar k f because uh, in both cases the energy is h bar square k squared by k f squared by 2 m. So, now the energy of uh, the electron uh, when it is close to plus k f its wave number is close to plus k f may be written as follows. So, this uh, square term clearly has three pieces one is k f squared which is the original Fermi energy and there is a cross uh, I mean there is a cross term. So, the cross term tells you that it is basically so this small k is a basically the deviation from so this is the actual wave number k f plus k itself. So, k therefore, is the deviation of the wave number of the particle with the highest possible energy and k f. So, it is the deviation from the actual uh, wave number and the Fermi wave number. So, it tells you how, how much those two differ. So, now you see the energy is linear in that difference. So, it is it is proportional to k which is that uh, the difference between these two and the proportionality is basically related to what is called Fermi velocity. Fermi velocity is nothing but the Fermi momentum divided by mass. Okay, um, so, similarly for if the particle is close to the uh, other end namely its, um, its, its momentum is minus h bar k f then its energy is going to look like this. So, it is going to be less than E f. Uh, well, that depends on the sign of k. So, it is it certainly has a different sign compared to when it was uh, near k f. Okay. So, now there are two possibilities. So, you see uh, when you are summing over all this, so you want to see uh, what the en energy of the or uh, what the electron with the highest possible energy uh, does when an impulse is switched on. Uh, so, the thing is that when the impulse uh, uh, is uh, switched on on the system then uh, the, uh, the electron with the energy close to uh, the momentum close to h bar k f is going to try to uh, increase its momentum to uh, h bar k f plus k. The reason why it does that is because it wants to scatter into an a place where there are no electrons. So, see for any momentum greater than h bar k f there are no electrons because those are the unoccupied states. So, the electrons would like to uh, uh, switch to uh, uh, a situation where the uh, wave number or the momentum is basically greater than h bar k f. Okay, so, this is your uh, h bar minus h bar k f and plus h bar k f. So, the electron which is here wants to scatter there because here everything is filled up. So, similarly an electron here would want to scatter there. So, you see uh, so that is the point. So, the energy is going to look like this. So, if you just uh, uh, in general write like this 
right. So, uh, so uh, for the right movers, so the, these are called right movers and left movers. So, the electrons whose wave number or, Fermi, uh, or their Fermi momentum is close to h bar k f plus h bar k f, they are called right movers. They are called right movers because basically their momentum is positive which suggests movement to the right, at least in the classical way of thinking. See, whereas minus h bar k f are called left movers because that momentum suggests movement to the left. Now, generically the energy of either right movers or left movers may be written as E f times or E f plus uh, Fermi velocity times h bar k dash. So, now this k dash you see if you are a right mover you want k dash to be positive so that your energy is greater than k f. So, you are scattered. So, this is the energy that the electron has after it scatters because of the impulse. So, now because of the impulse the electron scatters to an energy which is greater than E f it, if it was a right mover, but uh, if it was a left mover it will actually uh, try to uh, uh, go here. Okay, so, its, it's, it's new uh, momentum is minus k f plus Okay, it's it's minus k f minus it's 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 e even smaller. Okay, so it's minus k f minus k dash. Okay, so it's k dash less than zero. So in other words, it's like it's like this. In general, it, it's it's always like this, plus or minus k f plus k dash. Now, if it, if you choose the plus sign, you should make this also positive. But if you choose minus sign, you should make this negative because uh, if you choose minus k f as your starting point then you want to scatter to the left right because then you will be out of that uh, Fermi C. So, this Fermi C is within this segment. So, if you are at the point minus k f which is the left extreme. So, after scattering you want to continue moving left because that is where all the empty states are. But if it is plus k f you want to continue moving right because that is where again all the empty states are because if you are at the right and you uh, after scattering you move left then you will encounter all these filled electrons there and then you will be violating Pauli principle and you do not want to do that. Okay, so, the point is that uh, these uh, states are now going to uh, correspond to right movers uh, okay, when it is k dash is uh, greater than 0. and they correspond to left movers. So, they correspond to left movers. So, they correspond to left movers when uh, the Fermi momentum is uh, negative. Okay. So, now you see uh, you can see that uh, so, in this case the Fermi momentum or the Fermi uh, wave number is plus k f here is minus k f. Okay. So, now you can see that uh, this uh, allows you to do the following. So, it allows you to write down the wave function of that uh, particle with the highest possible energy after scattering as follows. So, suppose if it is, so in other words if it uh, was like this to begin with, okay, so that means if it had plus uh, uh, scattering. So, it would uh, scatter this way. So, it would uh, after scattering it would look like this. Okay. So, if it was uh, minus k f it would look like that. Okay. So, if it was plus k f there would be uh, the original piece plus the scattering piece, but then uh, it would uh, only involve the scattering piece if it was minus k f. Okay. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, the um, yeah, because this is summed over both the, uh, regardless of uh, whether it is uh, right or left to begin with, you are summing over k dash. So, you, there you have to sum both right and left. Okay. So, now this uh, if you just uh, you know highlight in your uh, highlighter, if you highlight this part, this is going to correspond to the Green's function of the right movers. It is called that as usual because if you multiply that by your strength of your potential, if you multiply that by with your potential, 
you get the actual wave function. And then if the potential is uh, not uh, impulsive, either spatially or temporally, then you will have to integrate over the location and the time at which the impulse is. So, in other words, you have to integrate over all those x zeros, t zeros in order to get a more uh, realistic potential. So, in, a, in other words, in order to solve the Schrodinger equation for a more realistic potential. So, this would correspond to the Green's function of the right mover, this would correspond to the Green's function of the left mover. So, uh, I hope you have understood uh, this uh, concept. This is an exceedingly important concept, the concept of right movers and left movers. So, basically right movers are uh, parts of the fermionic wave functions that uh, in a many body system. So, if you have a many fermion system and you look at the uh, wave function of a particle of, of a fermion with the highest possible energy and you ask yourself what does the wave function of that particle with the highest possible energy look like if its momentum is also positive. So, so the wave function that corresponds to all those uh, descriptions or qualifications, those are called right movers. Okay? And uh, conversely, if you are interested in the wave function of a fermion with the highest possible energy in a sea of uh, you know fermions that are filled up to that particular energy then uh, and you further demand that the wave uh, the momentum or the wave number of that fermion is negative then uh, you would be looking at uh, the part of the wave function that corresponds to what we call left movers now I am just giving you a graphical example and if you plot the probability density of only the right movers, so what you are going to effectively get is, uh, is this, so you are going to get this. So what this says is the square of that that is. So you see that particular function uh, if you plot it as a function of uh, x minus x0, so you see that if uh, initially if it is at x0. Uh, later on it will not remain at x0. So, it will actually peak. So, this this will peak always at x0 plus v f t minus t0. So, basically what this says is that uh, this uh, the probability of finding this particle uh, keeps shifting uh, to this new value of x and that new value of x is the original value plus the distance it has traveled uh, if it were a some disturbance traveling with some speed v f. So, that is the interpretation you see. So, right mover is basically a disturbance that travels with a speed plus v f. So, that uh, the wave function that you are looking at always peaks at uh, the original starting value plus the distance uh, the wave function or the peak of the wave function has traveled in that particular time t minus t dash. So, that distance traveled is v f times t minus t dash. So, this is a description of uh, right mowers and left mowers. So, I am going to stop here and uh, I hope uh, this is an exceedingly important concept because later on you will see that I uh, will be invoking this idea to describe what are called Luttinger liquids and you will find that they are very useful and they are very interesting, they have counterintuitive properties and so on. So, they are worth learning. But uh, before I get to all that, I am going to again shift gears and in the next class, I am going to dis describe more conventional uh, field theoretic uh, introductory topics namely the Dirac equation and the Klein Gordon equations and uh, why field theory is needed to properly interpret them because in the absence of field theory none of these equations make sense. So, okay, so, in the next class, I am going to uh, touch upon these ideas and try to explain to you why uh, you know without field theory, the relativistic theory of the electron makes very little sense. Okay, so, I am going to stop here and I hope you will join me for the next class. Thank you.